Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the presentation. The title of the talk is Bootcamp to Appium on Android Internals. So before we go on to the session, let me take a quick moment to introduce myself. I'm Stravan Medarapu. I work with Badu as a software engineer QA. Badu is a mobile dating app company. We also have a product in India called Bumble. That's about me, what I do and where I work. Apart from that, I was also a core contributor to Appium UI Automator 2 driver and UI Automator 2 server modules. Before getting on to the presentation, let me quickly understand how many of you at least written or executed a single script in Appium? Yeah, fair enough. Thank you. So if you're someone who used Appium for quite some time but don't know much about the internal stuff, what happens inside, you know, when you execute a find command, you know, what happens inside, or uh, if you're someone who used Appium and faced some issue with the Appium API but don't know how to debug this stuff. Or if you're someone who are using Appium but want to give say, your own implementation by extending or uh, implementing a new handler in Appium, this session should help you in doing so. So let's get started. So we'll be discussing the entire presentation in two parts. In the part one, we'll be discussing more about the Appium basics. And in the part two, we'll be spe specifically looking into how it works in, the, in terms of UI Automator driver and UI Automator server. So, if you pay the right attention, by the end of the presentation, you should get a hint how to implement a new handler and extend the entire Appium code base. Make sense? Let's get started. How Appium works. On a very, very high level, on Appium, we have three layers in it. This diagram, picture here, is from the context of Appium on Riot. We have three layers. One is the client module, where you make a request to perform an action. And we have a couple of servers. One is in server running on your host machine, which we generally call it as Appium server. And you also have another server running on your phone. So here the client module is where you make the request. We have different client bindings available. Let's say Java bindings, C Sharp, Python, Ruby, and so on. But if you're using Java and want to find an element, this is how you typically, typically make a request to find the element. So driver.find element by ID with some whatever ID that you wanted. When you give this request, what this client module does is it interprets the given request into an HTTP request. So when you make a request to find an element, it turns out to be a HTTP request. Here is the HTTP request for the find element. It's a post method, again, as some specific API part. Also, you have got some payload. In the payload, you are conveying about your search criteria. You are trying to find element by using ID with some value of ID. So when you make this request from the client, the, we are hitting the server running on, the, on your host machine, which is an Appium server. And the Appium server consumes the request. And what it does is, it tries to find out who is responsible for the given implementation. If the server itself is responsible for implementing this find element, it will go and execute the implementation. But if not, what happens is it forwards the request to the uh, server who is responsible for the implementation. Let's assume that the find element implementation is not responsible by the Appium server, but as other server that is running on your phone. So in that context, we are forwarding the same request to the server running on your phone. And the server running on the phone consumes that request and acts on the request. And whatever the action response that we have, we send back to the colleague. So let's assume that the request is failed because the given element is not identifiable in the screen or app. So in that context, you will get a 500 status code, and you also get some JSON response about the operation. What's interesting here is the JSON response that we're getting. With the help of JSON response, the client, the colleague or the client actually tries to understand what the response is. Here the status you see in the JSON response is seven. What does it mean by seven? Is it, the seven has a unique definition that is not element not found. We're not sending the entire information, we're just sending the status code. With that, you now client is in sync with the status code, so it will try to decrypt what it is. And we are also saying some string representation of the entire execution, which is put in the form of value. And finally, we also have a session ID. Why do we have a session ID here? Is to distinguish the from one session to other session. So we are sending some status to this to the caller. The caller here is the Appium server that is running on a host machine. And the server running on the host machine 
takes that response and forwards the same to the server, to the client. And finally, client receives this request and interprets the given response. And what response that we have is a 500 status code and we also have a status as seven. And it interprets and finally comes up with the final outcome of the entire execution. So the entire execution result is no such element found exception. That's how the client module works. So if you summarize the entire stuff, what these individual modules are doing, the client module is trying to interpret the given request and whenever you get the response, it again interprets the response. That's what the client module doing. And the rest of the two models we have, the AppM server and the server running on the phone, are there to serve your request. Based on the type of action, it might be served at the AppM server or it might be served at the phone, uh, server running on your phone. So that's what happens during this execution flow. So let's move on. What happens during the AppM server starting? This is the key thing that we need to understand, what happens when you start the AppM server. If you're starting the AppM server from the GUI, that is AppM GUI that you have, or from the command line, these are the general logs that you see, isn't it? So, but the interesting thing is, we need to understand what happens when this piece of logs get executed. Inside, specifically, if you're running the AppM from the command line, the command that you use is AppM. But how does it know what should do when you run the AppM command? You have that mapping available in the package.json of AppM module. Inside the bin object, you have a AppM command here, and it's again mapped again as some file. What the file name here is main.js, that is available in AppM module we have. So, now we need to look into what's going on in the main.js file. Let's quickly understand what's going on inside this class. We have a main function which is being exported, and if you try to understand the code flow, here the code flow that you're seeing is not exactly same as that you have here in the AppM code base, but we expected the core information that we need to understand. The first thing that it's doing is it's instantiating the AppM driver. What is an AppM driver here is, the AppM driver is responsible for managing your driver and also manage your, uh, manages your session details. And we are doing, we are invoking another function called route configuration function. What does this route configuration function does is, it will try to register the routes that AppM supports. What do you mean by routes here? It's the APIs that the AppM supports. So when you're trying to find an element, it's, a, it's a turning out as an HTTP request. So it's an API. So that, that list will be registered over here, but how does it know what are the supporting libraries that we have? That information is being fetched from here. The information that you're seeing here is from the routes.js of AppM base driver. And these are all the possible routes that we have. If we, for an example, we just extracted a couple of routes that we have. The first route that you're seeing is route for the find element. So if you carefully observe, we have a key pair value information here. The key here is an API path. And for your information, this is the API path that, that we have for the find element. And in the, in the value, we have a bunch of other information, which is a specification for the entire API path. And this, the post method, is talks about the HTTP method that we have. And what's interesting here is the comment. What the command conveys to us is, we have a find element API, but we don't know where it's been implemented. That implementation details we'll get from here. Here the command find element will tell us that we have the implementation available in this function. But, about they, but where we have this implementation function available is something that we're gonna see in some part. But for now, remember that we have the implementation available in this command. And finally, we also have some payload information. That is not something that we want to have a look at right now. So, if you summarize this entire stuff, we have an API path, and we also have HTTP method, and where it's been implemented, and we have some failure. And this one that you're seeing here is a route that is related to hide keyboard. We pretty much have the same information here. API path, HTTP method, implementation function name, and finally some payload. So when the server registers this stuff, server knows that we have all these possible API paths, and server also knows where it's been implemented. So when this, you make a request to server that I want to execute a find element, it just goes and executes this find element function that we have in the API. But where do we have this implementation is something that we're gonna see in some time. Make sense? So that's what the route configuration function does. And finally, we're invoking another function called base server. What does this base server does is, it instances, uh, it will start the API server and register the route that we just see. 
With that, we have AppM server up and running. That's the flow. When you start the AppM server, that's what happens in the back end. And the next one is the important modules related to Android. So, we are in, uh, in this presentation, we're only talking about the Android, nothing to do with the iOS and rest of the, uh, rest of the topics. We'll only be seeing what are the important modules that we have in the Android context. The base driver, Appium base driver, is the base for the all uh, Android drivers that we have. It could be an iOS driver, or Android driver, or Windows driver, whatever the driver it is, it's all backed by Appium base driver. But it also got some submodules in it. Let's have a look at what these submodules and what they are responsible for. We have a base driver, which is responsible for handling the driver and the session details, and you also have a Espress. Espress module is a Node.js module, again, which is responsible for managing your Appium server. When you have a server up and running, it's the, this is the model that actually does the entire thing. And JSONWP proxy and JSONWP status are responsible for managing, uh, proxying the request to the server running on a phone and interpreting the status that we got from the server. That is about these two modules. And finally, we also have a protocol module. What is this protocol module does is, it actually registers the routes that we have. The couple of routes that we have seen is actually lying inside this protocol module. And all these submodules are available in Appium base driver. That's about the base driver, but we also have some implementations for this driver. One of the first driver that we have in Appium is Appium on Android driver, which is backed by Google APM, Google UI Automator 1 API. And we also have a cell Android driver, which is there to support cell Android for you, but it's no longer been used or maintained. Now it's been deprecated. The actively maintained driver that we have right now is UI Automator 2 driver, and which is backed by Google UI Automator 2 API. It actually supports the latest versions of the devices for you. And we also have a very recent driver being implemented called Espress driver. This Espress driver is backed by Espresso, Google Espresso test automation framework, and we'll not be discussing more about this Espresso driver, but if you are interested how it works you know, inside what happens during the entire execution. I highly recommend you to join my colleague uh, Rajdeep presentation that is gonna happen in the same room at 4.30 p.m. And by the way, Rajdeep is, the one, is one of the contributor for Espresso, uh, Appium Espresso driver. But for the rest of the conversation, we'll be looking into the UI Automator 2 driver, how it works, you know, what happens inside and everything. That's about the few driver implementations, but we also have some utility sort of Node.js modules related to Android. The one of the first and um, regularly used module is Appium ADB. Why, we do we, why do we have this module? It's actually wrapper around ADB that we have. If you remember, we are using ADB commands for quite many reasons. Let's try to understand where we're trying to use them. We are using this AD, Appium ADB module to find the connected devices. When does this happen? It is during the create session flow. When you try to create a session, this is one of the few locks that you see. What it is doing is trying to find the connected devices in the host machine. At every li line of the lock, you actually see a module name here. And the, at the first line, the Android driver is the module name, and the ADB is also a module name. So if you are trying to an analyze any locks, you know where it's been generated by looking at the module name that we have. That's about fetch, finding the connected devices. We are also using this module during installing and uninstalling the APKs. When does that happen? Again, during the create session flow. We are also using this device, uh, this APM ADB module to fetch the device details. What sort of device details? It could be a device API version, or it could be a screen size information. For that sort of info, uh, details, we are again using this module. And we're also using this module for doing the port forwarding. Basically, why do we need to do the port forwarding is something that we're gonna see sometime. But for now, remember, we're using this APM ADB for doing the port forwarding. And we are using for quite many other, for quite many other places, but just remember, wherever you, use, wherever you do the ADB commands, it's from the APM ADB. We also have the APM Chrome driver. What it does is it actually manages Google Chrome driver. Why do we have the Google Chrome driver in place again? We are using Google Chrome driver to interact with the web views in the hybrid apps or 
to interact with the web application, let's say uh, Chrome application in the, in the Android context. So this driver, this uh, Appium Chrome driver, actually does that stuff. And we also have a utility model called Appium Support that is there to help you in doing file or image related operations. So that is about the utility models that we have in Appium. With that, we pretty much cover the part one of the module where we discuss the basics of Appium, how it works, and what we got in the Appium. But now let's look into the Appium UI Automator 2 driver and UI Automator 2 server. The first thing, where do we have this Appium UI Automator 2 driver and Appium UI Automator 2 server comes into the picture. The Appium UI Automator 2 driver sits in the uh, Appium server as a sub-module, but Appium UI Automator 2 server is an independent module that actually runs inside your device. Make sense? Driver module sits in the Appium server and UI Automator server sits in the uh, device by you. Let's try to understand what these modules are responsible for. The key responsibilities basically. The UI Automator driver is responsible for managing your session and when you say session, it is responsible for giving implementation for the create session, delete session and it also responsible for starting the UI Automator server in the device. What it does is it also gives the implementation for the handlers. If you generalize the uh, Appium handlers, there are two types of handlers. One is a handler that's been implemented at the Appium level itself by using Appium ADB or sort of thing. Let's say you want to give an, uh, you want to install an APK or fetch some device details or hide the keyboard those sort of things can be achieved by implementing the UI Automator 2 driver itself. And the other category is, you want to rely on some other modules, let's say UI Automator server or Chrome driver, it just proxies the request to the corresponding module. So if it's a something, if it's an API has been implemented at the UI Automator server layer, it just proxies the request to UI Automator server. But if it is something that's been implemented at the Chrome driver, it just propagates the request to Chrome driver. And we are only uh, using Chrome driver for web view related actions. Make sense? That is about the UI Automator 2 driver. Let's move on to the uh, UI Automator server. A UI Automator server is responsible for giving a lightweight server. It manages lightweight server for you, and it also um, gives the implementation for the handlers that you have. Handlers can be a find element or clicking operations. It could be anything. The, all those implementation goes in this module. So that's about these two modules. If you summarize these two things, the driver module is responsible for managing the entire session and proxying the request to the corresponding module. And whereas the server module is responsible for managing a lightweight server in the device and give the implementation for the handlers that it's supposed to be. That's about these two modules. But now we are going to see an interesting part, what happens during the create session. If you're using Java client, the typical way how you make a request to create the session is by using this capability. What, inform what information is important here is the automation name that we're specifying. The automation name capability that we're explicit setting is the UI Automator 2. What is UI Automator 2 here is we're explicitly requesting the RPM server that we want to create a server using, you create a session using UI Automator 2 driver. And we also understand just before when you make a request from the client module, it actually interprets into a HTTP request. So, the create new driver is something will turn out like this. You have a post method, again as some API path. You also have a payload information where you have desired capability. The desired capabilities or the payload is something that we not bother about it. But what is important here is the API path and the HTTP method. Why do we need to bother about them? Because that's, that's what the server actually respects. It doesn't respect much about the desired capability, whether you have right property or something, to give, uh, actually, at, at least to work on it. And we also seen we have these routes available, which gets registered during the Appium server start. This is the route that is related to create session. You have an API path, again, as post request, and you also have a command that is called create session. So it must give you a hint why we have a command create session here. The UI, RPM server will invoke this create session function when you, when you request for creating the session. How does it happen? Is using this function. 
You don't need to bother about the code base here, the, but the, you need to understand what the SNC is doing. The key thing is we have a spec command here. This spec command will actually map it to a route that we have and the route command that we have. The route command that we have is create session. So this spec dot command will turn out a create session. And the what does this execute command does is it invokes the create session for you. It actually invokes the create session function. But where does this create session function exist is something that is we want to look. The create session function should be available at every module that we have, every driver module that we have, whether it could be an UI automated driver, or espresso driver, or Cylindroid driver, or RPM automated driver. But we explicitly specified in the capabilities that we want to make a request by using UI automated to driver. So this create session function will get invoked inside the UI automated driver that we have. Here is the create session function we have inside UI automated driver module. We're not putting it to the code base, but we're actually looking at the essence of what it is doing. The very first thing that it does is it actually creates the session ID and register the capability. That's fine, but why do we need to create session again? Why do we need to have a session ID? Session ID is needed to support the parallel execution. Everybody knows that APM actually supports parallel execution. So how does it know from one session to other session? It actually takes the help of session ID to distinguish from one session ID to other session ID so that it will actually in distinguish from one session and another session and actually executes in the right device that we want to do. So that's about why we have a session ID and why we are registering the capabilities. And moving on, it actually installs two APKs in the device, namely UI automated to server APK and UI automated to server test APK. One is a server APK and the one is server test APK. Why we have two APKs is the first server APK will have a server implementation and the, and the rest of the test APK will have uh, access to the server and it just starts the server for you. So server APK has the implementation and the test APK will just start the server for you. That's about it. But how does it happen? How does the server start? Is by using this command. You don't need to understand the entire thing, but you need to understand the couple of arguments that we're passing. Basically, it actually starts in a test for you that is available in the test APK. The first param that we are seeing is the package name of test APK. So where the second param that we have is the instrumentation test runner. What's the beauty of the instrumentation test is it actually have the access to the uh, server APK that you have. We have two APKs, one is server APK and one is test APK, and we are running the instrumentation test from the test APK. So the test APK will have access to the server APK code base, and it actually starts the server for you. With that, you have a server up and running. That's fine. You have server up and running, and you are in host machine, but how do you make the connection between these two modules? We need to make a connection so that we can give some request to perform an action. To do that, we have to do, do the port forwarding. That's the reason why we have a ADB port forwarding. To do the ADB port forwarding, we need to execute this command with the help of the APM ADB module. What is important here is the couple of parameters that we are passing. The first port number that A200 is the port that we have in the host machine. And the second port 4723 is the port that we have in the uh, server that is in the device. When you execute this piece of command and make a request from the host machine, it actually forwards the request to the server running on the phone. So how do you make a request to execute a, uh, execute a, uh, execute a API in the, server, in the device? Is by making a HTTP request. And how are we doing it? Is with the help of ADB port forwarding. That's about ADB port forwarding. And finally, what it actually does is, it actually installs the application under test for you. So you are actually, Passing the application under test during the capabilities, it takes the help of the capabilities, installs the APK for you, and launches the app. That's the overall flow of create session. But if you summarize, what we got with the help of UI Automator, uh, UI Automator create session is this. The UI Automator server driver module, which is sitting in the RPM server, is starting the server in the device and doing the port forwarding to make a request and also starting the application under test. With that, we have the right platform to execute the test case for us. We have a server up and running, uh, test up, uh, application under test is launched, 
and what is being forwarded. With that, we have the right, right platform in place. That's about what happens during the create session. Now let's try to understand these internals, what, what we got in these two modules. First, let's have a look at the driver module. We pretty much discussed everything about the driver module on the core sense. Uh, to summarize, we have an implementation for the create session and delete session, and it also gives the implementation for the commands that we have seen in the routes. But what is important is the server module. It got a whole bunch of stuff. To summarize, we have two APKs as we discussed. One is the server APK, and the other one is server test APK. The server APK is responsible for managing a server, and it also responsible for implementing the APIs. Let's say find element or making a click action, those sort of things will get actually implemented at the, this final module that we have. And the other APK is responsible for having a single test case. And what does that set test case does is, it actually starts the server that is available in the server APK. And that is the only way that we can actually start the server. Otherwise, you're sitting on a host machine, you have a server running, a, you have a server APK in the device, but how do you make a request to start the server on its own? We're taking the help of test APK to start the server in the phone. If you outline the entire architecture, this is what we got. We have both APKs running in single process, but if you get into the first APK that we have, which is a server APK, you have a netty server, which is a lightweight server, to give, uh, to respond to the request that we have. We have a request handler, where you have the implementation for the APIs. Uh, again, find element, clicks, whatever the stuff that you have, all those implementation will be implemented at this machine. But how does the server know what, what, what implementation do you have? We need to register in the server again. That happening in the Appium servlet. So what Appium servlet is doing is, it actually registering the implementation functions that we have in the server. But if you want to have a look at what's going on in the Appium servlet, it's just a class that is extended by some servlet and what it does is, it, re it register the handlers based on the HTTP type. First thing is, it registering the post handlers for you. And if you, if you get into this one, it is registering the, it instantiating the find element implementation by passing the right API path, the implementation class number, and HTTP type. With that, you are registering the implementation of the class for the API in the server. And when the server receives a request, it goes and execute this class name that we have. Make sense? Moving on. We have another APK called test APK. What it does is, it actually have a single test case, single test to start the server in the device. If you get into the server test that we have, the, the, it actually does two things. First thing is, it starts the server and waits until the server stops. So, it waits until the server stops, is fine. But how does it know what's the happy part for server to stop? It actually happens when you make a request to delete the session. That's when server knows to start to shut down the server, and that's when the test case actually ends its life cycle. So the server test that we have starts the server and waits for the delete session to be deleted. That's about the internals of this one. But the thing, how does these two modules communicate with each other? Again, this is the outline of these modules, how we, uh, one module communicates with each other. You have a UI driver, where you make the request to server, and the server running on the phone consumes that request, takes the help of Appium servlet, invokes the corresponding implementation, and that implementation class takes the help of Google UI Automator API to interact with the app and do the right action. And the same Google UI Automator the API gives the response about the entire action and sends this uh, entire execution status, and which actually sends back to the colleague who is actually UI Automator driver here. And the same status again sends back to the client. That's how these two modules communicate with each other. Now, moving on to the last topic of the presentation, which is a very interesting one: how to give implement new how to give the implementation for the new handler. If you want to give the implementation for the new handler, you have to make the changes at the appropriate level. On a very very high level, we have our three modules. One is the client module where you make the request. We have a driver module sitting on Appium server. Appium, drive, Appium host machine server, and you also have an another server running in device. So to give the implementation for the handler, we have to make the changes across all these layers. But the client model is something that we have different bindings available, and the implementation might differ from one implementation to other implementation. 
will not be looking into the client, but we'll be looking into the rest of the two things. The UI Automator driver implementation and the UI Automator server implementation. The implementation for the UI Automator driver is pretty much similar with the other driver we have. So if you know how to give the implementation for one driver, it's pretty much same for Espresso driver, Cell Android driver, whatever the driver it is. The first thing is we need to figure out what we wanted to do. Let's see what we want to do here. We want to achieve this functionality. What's happening here is we are opening the quick settings in the device. That's the first thing that we want to do. We want to define what we want to achieve. We want to open the quick settings. And let's see what we have to make change, where we have to make the changes. And the next thing is we have to define the specification for the API. I wanted, to be, I wanted this uh, entire operation to be a post call against the quick setting API, that API path that we have. And the other thing is where I want to give the implementation for this function. Why do we need to know about this one? Because I need to tell the server, APM server, that I have this implementation for this API path in this function name. And the next thing is the registering the route. As we discussed, when the APM server starts, it actually registers the routes for you. And this is the route that we want to register in the server, to, so server actually knows where we have the implementation. Makes sense? So the important thing is the command name that we have. The command name that we are giving is the open quick settings. And that is the same function that we want to give the implementation. But where do we need to give the implementation for this function? We want to give the implementation the UI Automator driver for now, but it is same for across all the other drivers. It could be a Cell Android driver, Espresso driver, or APM Android driver. It's pretty much same. So when I'm going on and giving the implementation in the APM UI Automator driver, you could see the uh, corresponding class name over there on the top. So I'm registering the uh, open quick settings function in the commands and giving the implementation. Now the fancy thing here is I'm forwarding the request to the server running on the phone. But if you want to give your own implementation, which can be done without, without help of server module or by using the APM ADP commands, we can go and give the implementation right here itself. But my intention is to forward the request to the server running on the phone. When you do this sort of thing, it turns out like this. We already have the port forwarded, and the server is running on the phone, and the port that we forward is 8200. So it, it hits the server that is on running on the server, that, that is running on the device. So it finally turns out like this. Now the thing is, we want to give the same API implementation in the server module that we have. Let's see how we can give the same implementation in the UI automator server. So again, it's the same API path, same HTTP method, same functional that we want to achieve. Again, we need to register our route in the APM servlet. Why do we need it? We need to tell the server, I have the implementation for this function, when you, get this, when you get the request, go and execute this functionality. So let's see how we can register it. What we're doing here is, as it's a post request, we are registering in the post handlers. If it's a get, you go and implement it, you go and add it in the uh, get handler that we have. And what we're, how we are registering it? By instantiating the class that we have, that we are going to give the implementation, and by passing the API path. Here you go with the implementation. We are creating the new class with the class name that we just registered and by extending the safe request handler and giving the implementation right here. The first thing that we are doing is implement, giving the implementation for the safe handler. When the server receives the request, this is the function that gets executed. So whatever the logic that you have to execute has to be inside this function. So that's about it. And now we are taking the help of UI Automator 2 API and doing the whatever action that we want. It is a very simple API to open the quick setting, which is not available in APM right now, but we are giving the implementation right here. So when you do this one, it actually does the thing that we wanted. It actually opens the quick settings. Make sense? With that, we did what we wanted. But we need to tell the client that I perform some action, I also have some response for you about the acknowledgement, basically. So finally, we are giving some acknowledgement. What information is needed here is the session ID, which actually gives you information about where it actually is executed. And a status code, which actually conveys whether the operation is successful or not. And finally, a user understandable string representation. The entire this response will turn out like HTTP response like this. The key thing here is the status ID, uh, session ID, which actually gives you a hint 
the distinguished from one, se sort of one session to other session, and the status that we have is zero. Zero indicates uh, zero indicates it actually got successful, and the value we have here gives you a, a end user uh, understandable string message that we have. That's fine, but what if I want to send some different uh, status? My, let's say that my whatever action that I'm doing is not successful, so I want to tell the client that the action is failed. That information probably you can look up to this lookup table. I think you know the names that we have is self-exploratory. If, if the element is not found, you could just send the seven status code. If you remember in the first part, in the first part of the presentation where we try to find an element, we actually got seven status code. So that's how it is. The client model do aware of the status codes and interprets based on the status, based on the status code. We just send the status code here based on the requirement. With that, we're done with the theoretical part. Now let's see how we can give the implementation for the same thing that we have here. So it's basically a live demo. You can expect, let's hope for the best. What we got here is, sorry. Let me mirror my screen. Uh -uh. What we got here is we have a we have a device or emulator connected. We have an appm session already created. This is the this is the log that you see from the appm session that we already have. I'm not sure whether it is visible to the last. But why do we need to care about this? We actually wanted to uh, choose the session ID that we have so that we can request the server to perform an action. So what I'm doing here is I'm just trying to capture the session ID that we have. So we are capturing the server session ID that we have. And before getting into the implementation, let me show you the demo for first, and probably later, we can see how we implemented this part. So it's just an HTTP request. So whether you do it from the Java client or somewhere, it doesn't matter. The easy way is to do a curl request or doing from the postman, whatever is easy. I find it doing the curl request is easy. What I'm doing is I'm trying to, sorry, just a second, please. So what I'm doing here is I'm just making a HTTP request. Again, it's the API that we just implemented. And finally, we also have a device up and running. We already have session in place. When you execute this API, we expect to get our open quick settings opened. So that's fine. You know, we just achieved what we wanted. But what goes inside is something that we want to have a look. So now let's get into the code base of how we implement it. If you remember, we, we actually wanted to make a change at two levels. One is the UI automated driver, and the other one is UI automated to server. First, now let's look into UI automated to driver, what we changes we made. The first thing that we made is we given the implementation for the open quick settings right here. Where did we give? Is we are inside the UI automated to driver, inside the uh, commands, we're adding in the actions dot, the actions just JS and we are registering the commands. When you register in the commands, during the server starting, it knows we, how, what the implementation, what sort of implementation that we have. So if you don't do this one, and just do the implementation, the server doesn't know whether you have the implementation or not. That's the first thing. And the second thing, we need to give the implementation for this API in the server, API, server model that we have. Now let's go back and see what we got in the server module. This is the focal core base of this is the focal core base of your automated server module. I'm not sure whether it is visible to the last. What we're doing here is we're giving the implementation for the open quick settings, which is being registered in the appm servlet. So if you see here, we're registering our open quick settings by giving the implementation. 
If you look into the implementation path, we're giving the implementation for the safe handle, and the fancy thing what we are doing is this one. We're taking the help of Google UI Automator API and invoking what we want. Fine, and finally, we're giving some response back. Now let's see the entire flow by debugging it. So what we're doing here is, I'm trying to enable the breakpoints by attaching the debug process. And we also have uh, enabled the breakpoints in the UI Automator driver module. And let's see, I'm resetting the device state. Let's try to understand the same flow again by executing the request again. So what the expectation is, it should come and stop at the driver module first. That's what happened. It came and stopped at the, uh, the driver module. And what we're doing here is, we're just powering the request to the server module. And when you do this, we already have uh, enabled the breakpoint over there, and it just goes and stops over there. And when you execute this part of, uh, this sort of statement, it should supposed to execute the required action that we wanted. And finally, sending the status back. And if you look at the request that we made, we still not got the response because we're still executing the function. Finally, giving the status back, and with that, we got the response that we wanted. Make sense? That's about what we did. Just to have a quick implementation, and we have this code base available in the references, probably you can have a look at a later point. That's about the demo part. Uh, so we, we got the references here for, the for both the server module implementation, the driver module implementations, and you also have some references to the entire stuff. And by the way, the entire slide, uh, entire slide's been added to the uh, Confusion portal. You can go and download the, conference, uh, download the slides over there, and probably you can have a look at the stuff. And if you have any questions, please do allow me uh, to answer. But if you, if you left later point, if you have any questions while after going home and having are looking into this stuff, you can reach out to me and share the feedback or questions at the links that we have here. So, open for the questions now. Hi, Stephen. Hello. Uh, I have a question uh, with respect to UI uh, 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 two. So, uh, when we uh, say a find element uh, using XPath, yeah. so how does UI uh, two uh, will go and look that? So, what I understand from the code is uh, it will uh, it will uh, generate an XML. And it will trace back. So, so for this purpose, uh, I understand it takes much longer time. So, uh, when I say find element by some ID, let's say find by find element by uh, this current content description. So then, how how does that uh, uh, work with UI two? Let me uh, answer the first question, which yes. is the XPath stuff. You, I'm not sure whether you are aware of the UI Automator viewer, which actually dumps the UI and gives you a, gives you a nice visual representation of the entire code base. What we're doing here is we're relaying on the UI Automator viewer, dumping the entire code base, creating an XML file, and then querying on the XML file. That's about the XPath flow. And the second question about the ID. In the context of ID, uh, ID or could be a class name or whatever the context, it actually relays on the UI Automator, Google UI Automator API, where you have a nice way. The, by the way, UI Automator API is pretty much similar to the Selenium API. What you do is you just go and uh, Query based on the ID or by class name or whatever, you can directly query by ID. It will re return the return ID. So that's the difference between the export and the ID. Yes. Uh, so in case two, it will not generate an XML. No, it will no, not. not it will not. Okay. Uh, last question. Yeah. Why do we have a port number as four seven two three? Uh, any uh, any specific reason? There is no specific reason. We just want to find out the. Uh, I, just the add, I just got to know it about yeah, like yesterday. So if you see in iPhone, uh, there is a key five seven two three. It's it's it means iPad. I just got to know yesterday in my workshop so from Bruno. We want to, we want to pick a random port which is not actually matched to the other ports that we have. So four seven two four seven two three is something that we could find. We found that is not not generally used. And again, it's customizable. The port number that we have seen is something by default. You have a capability to alter the uh, alter the port numbers. And 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 one of the unknowns of four seven two three is uh, something to do with uh, JSON hugs because when he was spiking out uh, APM and when he wanted to do something and that was unlock code for his uh, iPad or something, so he ended up saying, okay, it's four seven two three, and I'm going to put this as a port number, and that's how four seven two three came into play. 
nice thing. Any more questions? We can take one more. Okay, so actually I have uh, three questions. Is it okay? No, it's fine. Okay, I will make it quick. So the first, uh, I have seen the uh, design of the architecture, how the interaction, the driver, and the UI automator of, from Google. And where is the place of the Google automator driver itself? Is it in the OS level or any place? Uh, it's like a dependency in the server module. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a, a Gradle uh, dependency management file we, where you specify the dependency, which is a Google UI Automator to play. Okay, back. great. That's the first one. And the second one, I saw that you have to give the response back to the server, right? Yeah. After you do the action, did the action, and uh, uh, is the response itself uh, given by the Google UI no, Automator? It's something that we're cooking up on our own. Okay, so it, uh, the response itself uh, returned by ourselves. Yes, by by yes, our, yes. Our, our own the, function. The thing is based on the action that we are doing. Let's say you are doing some click action, and we are relying on Google UI Automator API. And Google UI Automator by nature gives you some response back. And based on the response back, we are cooking our own response so that client will be aware of the same thing. Uh, and the thing is, we are just relying on the web driver protocol APIs that we have. The status quo that you see is pretty much similar to Selenium web driver. Okay, so basically uh, we can uh, merge the response from the UI Automator and our self function. Uh, we are not merging it, basically. We are cooking our response based on the API response that we are, Google UI Automator API. Okay, response. okay, great. And the uh, last one, uh, actually, is it worth it uh, if we contribute to the UI Automator itself uh, because the espresso is coming soon, I mean? Yeah, it, it's a good question, basically. The, the thing is, we uh, this driver is came about two, three years back. The espresso driver is coming you know, up in about a couple of months back. Uh, I think from my personal opinion, the UI automated driver might get duplicated at some point or get merged to, into a single module. Now we have a four different driver modules. The plan is you know, see the feasibility, how we can merge these two modules and make it a single unique module and use it across. Good, good, I see. Thank you very much. Good. Let's give a huge round, round of applause to Shavan Thank you. for coming and sharing. So I would... The, the best part of uh, this talk uh, would be... For one second. Sorry. So if you have any questions or feedback, I would highly recommend you to do the, uh, access this URL and give the questions. Uh, if we don't find the time right here, probably we can discuss it later. And we have a question over there, if you, if you have time. Um, I think uh, we, we want we can discuss outside. people to eat okay, first fine. and then come back. So that's about it. And yeah. you have one, one more slide, if you don't mind. Yeah. Okay. And finally, we are hiring, you know, probably if you have some, if you are interested, probably do check out this portal and do let us know if you are interested. That's yeah. about it. Thank you, Shravan. Thank Thanks you. a lot.